The Lord is good. Amen. So I titled my message tonight, Jesus, your Jubilee. Praise God. We're going to start off in, um, in Hebrews chapter 4. We'll let her get that queued up. But if you have your Bibles, you can read with us. Father, before we get started, I just thank you. I thank you for releasing the presence of your Holy Spirit in this house. Oh, Lord, I need your help. I need your help, Lord God, to understand your word, oh Lord, for the way that it's written, Lord God, and I need your help to proclaim it, oh Lord, I pray that you would move me out of the way, oh sweet spirit of God, and that you, oh Lord God, would use me as an oracle, Lord God, a voice that would speak your truth to your people, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. praise God. Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 1, we're just going to go ahead and we're going to read a couple of different passages of Scripture tonight. And so it's a little bit reading, but, you know, I like to read the Scripture. Amen. It says, Therefore let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. And then just to give you a little bit of context, I don't want to overdo this because I really want to read, but in chapter 3, he reminded us of the children of Israel that did not have the faith, right? It was only Joshua and Caleb that had faith to believe God that he could get them into the promised land. And so he's using them as an example of believers that did not have faith. And this is really what's going on in the Hebrew, the church, uh, this letter that was written to the Hebrews you got to understand that that they, the likelihood is that they're in Jerusalem, that these were Jewish people that had converted to Christianity. And, and we've talked about it many times. I've preached out of the book of Hebrews many times that they were severely persecuted. They were severely persecuted by their own family members. It's even said that according to the traditions that we can read and, and, and evidence that we find that that fathers would even have funerals for their sons and that that if they owned businesses of commerce it was shut off so they were under heavy persecution and they were being tempted to go back to their former way of life to go back to the sacrificial system uh to go back to putting their faith in the sacrifices instead of jesus and so the writer of hebrews is encouraging the people of god not to go backwards so he's telling them he's using this as an example don't be like those that did not have faith. Don't be like them that fell short of the glory of God and were not able to enter into the promised land. And specifically, he's going to talk about rest. And so he says in verse 2, For if indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith. That's pretty important right there. So we probably need to just rest for a second and say that when the word of God goes forth, it is we have to be the ones that unite it by faith. Amen. And we have to connect our faith to the word of God. There's a lot of things that, that the Word of God says that we can believe God. We prayed for people that were sick in their bodies or feeling pain in their body. I know that the Word of God says that Jesus is a healer, amen? And it's beholden upon us to give Him His opportunity to heal, praise God, to lay hands on the sick and to believe God that they will recover, amen? And for you to also believe that you can be a recipient of His healing power. The Word of God says that Jesus, His body was broken, His skin was torn at the whipping post, then by his stripes we were healed. But not only that, I got to tell you something tonight, that you might have been a wandering sinner in the past, but you're no sinner no more if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You went from being a sinner to a saint. Hallelujah. You went to being a new creation in Christ Jesus. The Word of God says the old has passed away and the old and the new has come. Amen. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. But can you believe that? And I want to encourage you to have faith tonight, to put your faith in the word of God and to believe it, that the sin no longer has power over you. Amen. Sin, sin is defeated. The power of sin is defeated. The powers of darkness were defeated in Christ. Amen. The law was told us that we were guilty, Colossians 2, 14 and 15. But Jesus fulfilled the law. And he died on the cross. It says he nailed it to his cross. And he triumphed over 
principalities and power. Can you have faith tonight? Yes. To believe that he's given you opportunity for new life. Amen. And that it will just trust him. Amen. I can't. I can't. I, I don't, I'm tired of talking about myself. But I'm just saying I just can't get over the fact of where I was when I was 19. And, and I just can't. I just can't shake it. I can't forget what he's done. I, I look backwards and I'm just like. I'm just amazed. And I don't know why, because he's so amazing. I, it shouldn't be that hard to believe. And I'm here to tell you, don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let the devil discourage you. You might feel like you've fallen. You might feel like you've stumbled. But I want to encourage you to let you know that Jesus loves you. And he's proven it. God has proven his love to us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So let's, look by, by faith, let's connect our faith to the word of God. Amen. So the word was preached. But it wasn't united by faith to those that heard. For we have believed, for we who have believed enter that rest. Just as he said, see, there's a rest of God, my friend. I want you to know that too. When it comes to the finished work of Jesus and what he did for us at the cross, I need you to understand something. There's a rest. To find. Jesus said this. He said, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and, and, and take my yoke upon you, right? You will find rest for your weary soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come on. I kind of I kind of paraphrased it there, but you get the point. He's the, he's the one that accomplishes the work in our life. We have to learn how to enter into that rest. This is what the author is saying. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest because they did not believe. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sevens tonight because Jubilee is connected to sevens. But what I want to tell you is, is that a seventh in the, in the idea is a Sabbat or a Sabbath. It talks about God's rest. And, and, and let's keep on going. He says, I swore my wrath, although it's what he said somewhere on the, the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today saying through David after so long a time just as been said before today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts. Now I want you to know let's just go ahead and read verse 8. It says for if Joshua had given them rest he would he would he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So now this, this can get a little bit cumbersome. Okay, so let's just, let's just go back real quick and let's just kind of talk about this and maybe we'll do a little teaching right here. Uh, verse 7, it says, He again fixes a certain day today, saying through who? Saying through David. I think they hid my chalk. That's okay. I don't even have a chalkboard. But let me let me just explain to you. So so to to some of you that have been around for a little while, when we think about the chronology of the Bible, you know, we don't have to know the date, but who came first, Joshua or David? Joshua, right? And Joshua, he said, if Joshua had led them into the rest, then why would it be said after that that there was another day coming? Who did he say it through? He said it through David, who was the psalmist, the king that wrote the Psalms. So let me just tell you that Joshua is somewhere around the 1300 B.C. David is somewhere around 950 B.C. So look, about a 400 year span. So he said that, see, Joshua was, was promised to bring them into the promised land. But Joshua was a man of faith. Caleb was a man of faith. They believed that God was bigger than the giants in the land. They were able to believe and God brought them in. Amen. But the others were not able to enter in because they doubted and they did not believe what God's word 
had to say. Amen. But listen, what we need to understand is that he's saying, but that's not the final rest. If Joshua was the final, final rest, then David would not have said that there was a rest yet to come. And let me tell you this, that, that God rested on the seventh day. And so the final rest is not God resting on the seventh day. The, the, the final rest is not a Sabbath in the sense of you go to church on Saturday or you go to church on Sunday. No, David said there's another rest to come. And God's rest was a type of that. After he finished his work of creation, hallelujah, he rested from his works. And I got to tell you, after Jesus finished his work of the new creation, he ascended unto heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the, of the Father, amen, because his work was completed. His new creation work is finished. Jesus said it when he hung on the cross, his last words, it is finished. It is a completed work and I want to encourage you tonight that you can put your faith in that. You can trust in that and that the powers of darkness and the powers of sin have no more control over your life. I want you to know tonight that the Sabbath means rest and the Sabbath has a name my friend and what is his name? His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. There have been a lot of preachers through the years that said talked about, oh man, you need, you need to rest. You, and you, you, if you're not in the house of the Lord on Sunday and Wednesday, and should the Lord come, you're going to miss, right? <laughs> Lord help us. But let me, let me just say this, because see, sometimes we can overcorrect things. And, and we, can, we can overcorrect things in the sense that, oh, okay, so, so now I understand Jesus is actually my Sabbath rest, so now you now you have a situation where people don't feel like they have to really go to the house of God. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Okay. Yes. Now, let me just be clear here. We're not being a, a roles-oriented preacher. We're not being a works-based preacher right here. But let me just give you a couple of scriptures, which is interesting because one of these is a couple of the songs, or at least one of the songs that y'all saying, but in, in, in Ephesians 2, 19, you don't even have to turn to that. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow, fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Amen. Look at this one, though, in 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5, this is the song that we sing, and we're coming to him as to a living stone. John, would you do me a favor? I forgot to get my prop. Would you go run out there on the side where that little brick wall is and grab that one brick for me that's kind of broken off on that thing, on that little planter deal, if you can find it. If not, it's okay. You can just, you're going to have to come back in, or, or you can leave the door open. We're just impromptu sometimes. It says, look at this, coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men. That's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the living stone and he was rejected by men, but it's choice and precious in the sight of God. Thank you, sir. You can just actually just lay it right there. <laughs> yeah, it's a real brick. Thank you, sir. Throw bricks at him. Come on, Stephen. Hallelujah. All right. Precious in the sight of God, you also as living stone. Now, I want you to understand that Jesus is seen as the lively stone and he gives life to other stones. I want you to understand something tonight that you are living stones. The living stone has given life to you. And, and the scripture goes on to say that you, we are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what I'm trying to say to you is this, is that. We don't want you to, we don't want, if somebody's tired and they have to stay at home, I understand. I asked Naya to stay at home tonight. I'm going to be honest with you. The girl wore out. She got to get ready for, for Saturday. Okay, Naya's a little bit of a different animal. I mean, I'm not trying to talk to her. She might be watching. That girl that drove from Baton Rouge one time, I'm not trying to be gross, but throwing up with the door open outside, still making it lead worship. So she's a little bit, she reminds me of that my daddy did that one time. So, so she's a little bit different. But, but what I'm trying to say is I understand when people get tired. Yeah. 
But I, but I need you to understand that if you're a living stone, because people will say, well, I don't have to be in the house of God. I'm just trying to make sure that you understand that Sabbath is not you having to come to church. Sabbath has a name. His name is Jesus. He is the fulfillment of spiritual rest. At the same time, if you're a living stone that you've received life from God and you're way over here and oh. he's over here building a spiritual house yeah, over yeah. here of all the other living stones. See, what I'm trying to say is, is that we got to find a house of God where we feel as though we have been called to be and that we can become part of the work of God. Amen. And because, listen, it's bigger than us. Amen. And it's part of God's will that we be connected. That's Amen. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's what people that serve God do. Because the word of God says it even in the Old Testament. Uh, this is ahead of, I'm ahead of myself in my notes, but it says in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and listen, I'm going to tell you something too. If church is becoming a chore, yes, something's yes. not right, my friends. Yes. Yes. It might be your church, but it might not. Amen. I mean, we got to be real. Amen. We got we got to be honest. We can't. We got to can't just be picking on the people. We got to be honest. If, the, if church is a chore, the problem might be the church, but it could also be our heart. Yes, yes. Yes. Amen. And we got to check our heart at the door. We got to check our heart at the feet, foot of the cross. We got because church is not supposed to be a chore, my friend. Amen. You're supposed to want to be in the house of the Lord. Your 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 King died for you. <laughs> He came into town lowly and riding on the donkey, amen? And he died for you, and he hung on that cross for you. And the veil was torn. What does that even mean? It means you can enter in to his presence, and you can have an intimate relationship with him. Praise God. That's enough said right there, amen? Now look at this. I, I don't even know if this scripture ever stood out to me like it did, because we're talking about the house of the Lord. A little bit right here. What does this have to do with rest? Well, I just took a little detour. Work with me. First Timothy 3, 14 through 16. Look what it says. He says, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Look at this. Which is the church of the living God. Now look at this. The pillar and support of the truth. Yes. Do you, do you see what the Apostle Paul is saying right there? The church of the living God is the pillar and support of the truth. Yes. It is the true church of God, the remnant, the people that are that are have a desire to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and have the truth of God's word resident on the inside of them. When we come together and we stand in agreement, when we stand in unity with one another, we are the pillar and support of the truth in the midst of our society. Come on, somebody, help me out, because I'm preaching I'm preaching a lot better than, than what you feel. And I know, I, I, I make you think too much. But look, let me just say this. It, the, the truth about Jesus Christ and the fact that, it, that the truth about you, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when we come together and we stand upon that foundational truth, amen, then what ends up happening is, is that we are a light in the midst of a darkened world. Yeah. We are a light in the midst of, we're like a lighthouse upon a rocky shore, amen, that people are speeding towards collision, and we are giving them the opportunity to let them know. Amen. That there is a God in heaven that loves them and made a way for them to be able to enter into the rest of God. Amen. Praise God. Well, that was the first thing I wanted you, I wanted to read to you. I wanted you to know that there's a release in the rest of God, a liberty that comes from faith in the work of God. Is anybody in this place, have you ever felt like there were times in your life, maybe even after you gave your heart to the Lord, that you felt like you, you weren't free, that you felt like you were in, a, in bondage and closed in and tied up, okay? But I, I want you to know that in this next passage of Scripture, that the Lord, even in the Old Testament, 
wants you and I to know that there's a release. There's freedom in the truth of the gospel. Amen. And I want you to know that tonight. So let's look at Leviticus chapter 25. Another long passage of scripture that I'm going to read to you. It says, The Lord then spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I shall give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. So the first passage, we talked about rest. We talked about Sabbath, right? He says, now the land needs to have a Sabbath. My, my property needs a rest, okay? Six years you shall sow your field. You know what that means? It means to plow and to plant seed. So six years you shall sow your field. Six years you shall prune your vineyards and gather in its crop. But during the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field, nor prune your vineyard. Your harvests after growth you shall not reap, and your grapes of untrimmed vines you shall not gather. The land shall have a sabbatical year. I, I'm not, I'm not going to read any more just right the same, but I want you to think about that. He's saying, listen, for six years, you're going to plow, you're going to sow seed, you're going to prune vineyards, and you're going to reap harvest. But in the seventh year, you're not going to sow any seed. And then he says this, and look, I've created this in such a beautiful way that it's going to produce its own grapes. It's going to produce its own wheat. You don't even have, but don't go out there and get them grapes. And let me tell you why. If you read on and you really understand is he says this. He says, because I'm going to give you enough in the sixth year to tie you over the seventh year. Not only the seventh year because you can't plant again until the eighth year, but it's going to tie you over until you reap your harvest in the ninth year. <clears throat> now that takes faith, my friend. That takes faith to be able to believe God and to trust him that what he says and how he says to do it, that we it doesn't make sense to the logical mind. But the Lord says, hey, I'm not logical and I'm not natural. I'm supernatural. Don't try to figure it out in your own strength. Don't, try, don't hurt your brain. Right? I'm sure he's talking to me. Don't hurt your brain, son. You're always trying to be two steps ahead. You can't get ahead of me. And he's trying to let us know, amen, and, this, and listen, this goes back to the days of the manna, right? What did he say? Don't gather more than what you're supposed to gather. If you do, it's going to turn into worms. But on the sixth day, I'll let you gather enough for the seventh day, and it'll hold you over till you can go back on the first day and start gathering your daily allowance. He's been revealing to his people through thousands of years to trust him and that he's got them. He's got you tonight. I need you to understand that. I need yeah. you to believe that, that he's got you tonight. You can trust him. Amen. He's worthy to be trusted. The problem that we run into is we start seeing the things around us like Peter in the storm. And we hear the, the, boy, we hear the winds and we see the crashing waves. And, and we, begin, we begin to look at the storm and get our eyes off of Jesus. Yes. And we begin... We begin to sink. Okay, Lord, help us to trust you. Yes. Amen. Yes. He says, uh, he says, verse six, all of you shall have the Sabbath products of the land. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I just, I highlighted that in my notes. The Sabbath products of the land. The, the, the rest. There, there is some, I can't get off of this whole thing, though, about Jesus and his finished work. When it comes to victory, yeah. when it comes to victory in Christ. Victory in Jesus. Yes, yes. I'm here to tell you it's a finished work. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you that what he did for you was more than enough. Yes. Amen. The Lord has come to bring us victory. The Lord has come to do the work. Let's trust him. Let's have faith in him. All right. Hallelujah. He said, look, you're going to have the Sabbath products of the land. What? Well, that's deep. Sabbath means rest. If you rest in what I have provided for you, you're going to get some products, <laughs> spiritual products. When it comes to victory in Jesus, you're going to get victory. When it comes to healing, you're going to, your body's going to receive healing. When it comes to the answers to your prayers that you've been praying, just rest in me. Trust in me. Don't get, don't, 
Don't get sidetracked. Don't look at the things that are going on around you and quit believing in me. No, hold on to me. Just like the woman with the issue of blood grabbed a hold of the hem of my garment and she didn't let go. Hold on to me. Amen. You also are to count off, verse 8, seven Sabbaths of years for yourself. Seven times seven years, so that you have the time of the seven Sabbaths of years, namely 49 years, seven sevens. You shall then sound a ram's horn. I'm not going to go get it. <laughs> you shall sound a ram's horn abroad on the 10th day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. You shall sound a horn all through your land. You shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release. Through the land to all its inhabitants, it shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each of you shall return to his family. You shall have the 50th year as a jubilee. You shall not sow nor reap its aftergrowth, nor gather in from its untrimmed vines, for it is a jubilee. And verse 13 says, On this year of jubilee, each of you shall return <coughs> to his own property. A return home. Have you ever been on a long trip before and you got kind of lonesome and you were ready to get home? I was thinking about this in a spiritual sense that sometimes, not sometimes, I would venture to say that each and every one of us in this room, it's just got to be true because it happens to all believers that we've found ourselves at times ventured away from home. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We've we didn't even realize it when it was happening, but somehow we opened up some doors to the, some things or whatever happened. Everybody's story is different. Amen. And we find, found ourselves far from home. Yeah. And sometimes we didn't even realize that we were far from home and we didn't even realize that we were missing home. But then from time to time, we would realize that we were kind of homesick for the presence of the Lord and we'd call out to him. Amen. Amen. I want you to know that this year of Jubilee is so beautiful because look at this. On the Day of Atonement. <laughs> Y'all remember what the Day of Atonement is? The Day of Atonement is the one time of year that the high priest could enter beyond the veil and apply blood on top of the mercy seat. That Jesus, listen, the word, the word for mercy seat, I'm not trying to get too, too deep right now, but there's propitiation in the Greek language. Whenever Paul said Jesus is our propitiation, he was basically saying Jesus is our mercy seat. Jesus is the fulfillment of the day of atonement. You might have been far away whenever you, before you were even a believer, you were far away. But even at times in your own walk with God, you've been far away. But I got good news for you, amen, there's been a day of atonement, hallelujah, where Jesus' blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat of God, amen, and that now there can be a jubilee, hallelujah, and when the jubilee comes, it says freedom, I need you to understand that, there's freedom and there's liberty that's pronounced in the year of jubilee. Listen, I want I want to get a little bit deeper on the year of jubilee. What what would end up happening is is that is that is see in America if you can't pay your bills or if you can't work for whatever whatever reason, they have certain kinds of they got supplementation for people, right? Entitlement programs, and I'm not, listen, some people might be on these insurance, and it's not what I'm trying to say. Some people need these things, and we're grateful that we live in such a country like this. I mean, it doesn't mean that everything's done exactly right at the government level, but some people need these things, okay? But listen, what I want you to know is this, is that in Israel, it was a little bit different. If they couldn't pay their, they couldn't pay their bills, what would end up happening is, is that many times they would kind of sell their service to their fellow Hebrew brother, okay, who was a maybe a property owner, and, and they would work for him for six years, and then on the seventh year, they would be released. They would be released from the from the right. from the duty that they had right. indentured themselves to do. Amen. And that there was a there was a release in the land. And if they had lost their property, that's basically kind of like what was happening in the story of Ruth. They have lost their property, and Boaz, as a kinsman redeemer, bought it back. But all of these provisions were in there. See, because Ruth couldn't have even uh, afforded, I'm sorry, Naomi couldn't have even afforded the property had she waited for a year of Jubilee. 
She couldn't have even afforded the, the property at that point in time anyway, so she needed somebody to come in, and that's exactly what Jesus has done for us. I'm not trying to give you two different stories, but listen, we're staying on Jubilee, and I want you to know that there's a release and that there's a freedom in this story. There's a release and there's a freedom, and it came on the Day of Atonement, and I'm just trying to let you know that just as on the Day of Atonement, Jesus, amen, through his blood, through the shedding of his blood, has given us a release, and, there, and we are to proclaim it in the midst of the land that though we were far away, we can now have a return home, amen. Jesus came to rescue us. He came to bring us home. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, what happens many times, I, I kind of went back to the house of the Lord a little bit in my notes. And what happens many times is that people, they can get caught up in a, in a condition of spiritual slavery. And they can bring that with them to church. They think it's the church, but it's really their spiritual condition. And the spiritual condition they carry around with them, it can turn into a spirit of division. We got we to be careful about that because, look, Jesus isn't a divider. Jesus is a unifier. Amen. Jesus came to unify the people of God. He came to bring unity for the body of Christ. And division breeds confusion, but God is not the author of confusion or chaos. God's presence brings unity. God reconciles. He brings unity and release from spiritual bondage. So Jubilee is a time of release from a form of bondage. They, they had had to place themselves under, but on that 50th year, on that day of atonement, the ram horn was blown and they were released. And not only were they released, but they received their property back. They received their family back. Amen. And, and, and you and I sometimes there's different kinds of spiritual bondages that can happen in our life. Sometimes whenever we sit inside of, of the church setting, I've, I've had people say this kind of thing before. And listen, I've probably been here before, so please don't think that I'm fussing because I'm not. But where, um, I, you know, I've heard somebody say, I just don't like people. <laughs> I just don't like people, so I don't want to go to church. <laughs> And, and, you know, but that, that's, that's a sign of a problem, right? Yes, that's know. a sign of a problem whenever we don't like, because, I mean, that means that something's going on in yeah. here. And, and I get it. Certain people might irritate you, but, you know, that can be a sign of a problem, too. <laughs> like, right? We, Lord, we need help. Yeah. Do a work. Yes. Because I'm pretty sure that I've irritated my Lord more than one time in my life. Right? And, but he's been long-suffering, and he's been patient, and he's been kind. And the scripture is clear that Christ is to be formed in us, that we're supposed to look less like ourselves Amen. and more like Jesus. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, the one who says he's in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until yes, now. Yes. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause of stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now that word hate is kind of like a strong word, right? Mark kind of broke some of that down for us because it sounds strong. That word sounds really, really strong. And many people would probably say, well, I don't really hate, I don't really hate my brother or my sister. But let me ask you a question. And this is just between you and the Lord. Because the Lord knows that I have felt this kind of animosity before in my heart towards people. So I'm being transparent with you. But, I, but I'm just trying to say, when you see your brother or sister, or when you see someone who you know is a believer, but yet, how do you feel when you see them? I'm just asking you to be real with yourself. Because, look, we don't have that many people here, but there's a lot of different, probably, feelings and opinions that people might have about certain people that are in the body of Christ. So if you see someone and you're excited to see them, then that's a good sign that you probably feel love towards them. But if they, but if it's somebody that's done something to you in the past and you thought that you moved through it, right, 
But, but instead, in reality, you didn't move through it because you didn't really bring it to the Lord and you didn't realize it, but that was a big no-no. And what happened was is that you, you could have let bitterness fester. Have you ever, yes. you put, no, y'all have never dealt with bitterness before, I know, but, but unfortunately, I have felt bitterness in my heart yes. before. And, and what happens whenever I have bitterness in my heart towards someone, it's, just, it's an interesting thing that will happen. I'm trying to help you out. I promise you I'm trying to help you. I'm not trying to hurt you. When you see that person and there's a root of bitterness, you're not full of joy to run up and hug them. You're not full of joy to really feel like you love them. Instead, there's something there that's not right. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? All right. So what I'm trying to encourage you to do is to let you know this, that there's a jubilee for that. Amen. There's a release from that. And I'm here to tell you that there's a day of atonement for that. His name is Jesus, and he died on the cross. And listen, you can bring that to the Lord, my friend. You can get along with the, what were we singing in that song? The veil is torn. The door swing wide. I see glory. That veil being torn is Matthew chapter 27. The scripture says it. It says that whenever he died, he gave up. He said, it is finished. He gave up the ghost, amen, and the earth did quake, and the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. The Bible says it was one piece of embroidered cloth. Josephus said it was a hand's breadth wide that two yoke of oxen couldn't have pulled it together. I'm here to tell you, God grabbed that thing and ripped it from the top to the bottom, and what did it do? It signified that entry into yes. the presence of God was now made available <laughs> yes. for everyone. So listen to me, church. We are without excuse. If we allow bitterness to fester in our hearts, yeah. I'm not saying that it's easy, my friend. I'm here to tell you, though, that Jesus made a way. Jesus made a way, and this is the problem that we run into. If we hold on to that bitterness, it's affecting our walk with God. Yes, it's affecting our walk with God, and it, and it causes, it's, it becomes a defense and an opportunity to stumble. I just want you to know about your about your Jesus, man. He's not like that. Yeah. And, and we want to be like him. And it's only through the Holy Spirit doing the work in us that we can be. Amen. Yeah. Jesus said it. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Amen. As they as they ridiculed him and treated him so harshly. All right. So every seventh year there was a release, the trumpet blast on the tent on the day of atonement. Amen. Well, we need to understand, though, that <laughs> when we transgress God in his ways, it does open the door for the power of sin. And it, and it can allow an intrusion of Satan's power into our lives. I need, I need to say this right now. I want you to know Satan has no power over you. Amen. Amen. If you are a true believer tonight, I need you to know that. It sounds like they already quit preaching next door. But if you are a true believer tonight. Satan has no power over you. Now, can you believe that by faith? I hope you can believe that by faith because I'm here to tell you the word of God says it, that you've been made one with the spirit of God. Your spirit, 1 Corinthians 6 and 17, has been made one with his spirit. Amen. You have become a divine, a partaker of the divine nature that the, your old man was crucified in Christ and that your new man was resurrected in Christ and that you are a new creation. Yeah. And that the work of the enemy has no power over you. And the question is, can we believe that? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We don't really have time to get into some of this other stuff. Worship was so good. Praise God. Yvette, why don't you come up to the front? But, I, but as she's coming up to the front... I want you to know that uh, that part of what this whole jubilee was for, if you remember that, but it, it was it was instituted before then. But if you do, you remember the children of Israel when they were disobedient to God, and Jeremiah had a prophecy, and he said that they would be in captivity for seven years. Well, it it actually the Chronicles says this. It says those who had escaped from the sword and carried away to Babylon. And there were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Look at this. Until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. God said, you won't give me my Sabbath? I'm going to take my Sabbath. 
Because you know what the Lord says? He says, it says in Leviticus 25, the land does not belong to you. Okay? I, 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 want you to, I want you to understand this. Jesus, the Lord said to Israel, the land does not belong to you. Do not sell the land. He said this. He said, you are strangers with me in the land. We're sojourners together. Now, I really wanted to try to break that down with you. Now, think about that, right? If you're taking notes, write that down. What do you mean you're a stranger in your own land? That's Leviticus 25, 23. The land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently. The land is mine, but you're aliens and sojourners with me. How did that happen, Lord? How did you end up being a stranger on the earth that you spoke into existence? I think that we know. He gave power, dominion, and authority to Adam. And what did Adam do? He relinquished his authority. But I got good news for you tonight because Jesus then got it back for us. But what I want to tell you is, is that if the Lord has things in his word and he, and he, we need to get into the word of God. Amen. We need to get into the word of God and we need to understand the places where we may transgress the word and the will of God. The Lord said that. He said, he said, you, you did not keep my Sabbaths. And so I'm going to take, I'm going to take my Sabbaths. My land will lie fallow. My land will go unplowed because it belongs to me. And so I just want to encourage you. Listen, I was going to get into tithing. <laughs> I don't ever preach on tithing. I was going to get into it, but I want you to know, listen, you might be here tonight and you might be struggling in your finances. I don't have time to sit here and try to convince you on time. If I had time, I would convince you on time. Because the first time was paid by Melchizedek long before there was ever a law. Right? My Bible says that Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek while he was in the loins of his grandfather Abraham. The tithe was instituted law. The tithe was instituted in Abraham, and Abraham is the one that justification by faith was instituted into. Come on. And so, what does that mean? That if the tithe isn't the, the tithe isn't right, then it, what, what about justification by faith? It came before the law ever was. Is the point that I'm trying to make? See, some people you got to convince them about tithing, and, and listen, when it's all said and done, we may not agree on that, and that's okay. I'm okay with it. Really, I am. If you, if you have a choice to believe that, I believe that that's what the Word of God says. But what, but what I will say is this. Just don't use this excuse for me, please. Don't say, I, I can't do it because I don't have enough. Because I'm here to tell you that if you believe in tithing, you have to do it so that you will have enough. And some people might be like, yeah, but I've got plenty and I don't tithe. Yeah, well, that just means you know what to do with your other 90%. I wish we were all like you. Amen. But we're not all like you. And, and, and that's really the problem that we run into. I wasn't going to talk about tithing because we ran out of time. But that's really the problem that most of us run into when we don't have leftover at the end of the month is that we have problems with the 90%, not the 10%. Okay, but Lord, help us to understand that if this is real, what I'm telling you, and I believe it is. You'll have to study it out for yourself and see what you believe. But it may be the answer that you're looking for if you struggle in your finances or if you struggle in other things. I don't have time to get into all that tonight, but I've been said it before. I said it recently that, listen, whenever I was obedient in some of the things that the Lord told me to do in giving, I saw supernatural spiritual increase in my walk with the Lord. Amen. And I'm not saying you can buy spirituality. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about obedience to God and his will. Amen. Let's